This is not an easy question. So cities facilitate knowledge spillovers. So the idea of the spillover is that we, we kind of work together and even though you might have one intended purpose, the fact that you're communicating and collaborating with somebody else in another area or something, your knowledge kind of helps build on each other. You kind of feed on each other, right? That's the spillover effect. Uh, and economists spend a lot of research time trying to measure these spillover effects. In fact, that was part of my um, dissertation. So if a city is a center of innovation, an innovative city, any come to mind of a city that's really kind of leads Valley. the chart? Silicon Valley would be up there, right? So how can you measure innovation? How do we know that Silicon Valley is a better innovator than Otto, Kansas? <laughs> or or uh, Fargo, North Dakota. They have a huge share of bringing new products to the market. Okay, so in terms of how do we measure information, how could we do that? You're on the right track, or one, one track. I don't know if there's an exact one. How do you measure innovation, the level of innovation in a city? So you talked about products, so how can we measure? Just I want you to kind of push your brain into how would we measure that then? in a particular area. We're comparing Silicon Valley, or let's just say San Francisco to Kansas City. Which one's more innovative? How would you measure it? There's your problem for your, for your final paper for your senior core project. Nothing. <laughs> so would it be the size of the OK, so what's measurable that we could sink our teeth into? Okay, so patents would be one thing that we get from innovative cities. So is that measurable? Yeah. Yes, right? They come from the government. There's an application. A patent is issued. Boom. Now, does that perfectly measure innovation? No. That's what economists struggle with is how can we have something tangible to measure versus what we think is really going on? And so maybe we can look at number of patents. Maybe we can look at the number of new products, which might be a different measure than patents, but number of patents is at least a hard and fast number that we can maybe uh, track. New, uh, job opportunities. new job opportunities. So maybe uh, the number of jobs with starting pay over a certain amount or something might help track the level of innovation going on, the amount of education, technology, development. I don't know. It's an interesting question that doesn't have a lot of easy answers. That continue to try to um, tackle. All right, so let's create an economic model where there's no scale economies in production or exchange. We can work but in isolation or we can work together. So it's an alternative. Working together, living in a city is an alternative. Innovation works through face-to-face -face contact or being in close proximity, possibly by uh, happenstances. We both go to the coffee shop and we exchange information, right? So there, it's not necessarily designed that we're going to be a, a company and um, we have lunch together. Nobody can go to outside lunch, so we design a forcing us to be together. So it could be other things that are unrelated to that that ends up coming, being around other people that are thinking about different things. All right. So here's the picture that was kind of going on related to number, number 12. So top graph. The number of workers in a city, and we're trying to measure the payoff from innovation. So first thing we notice, increasing at a decreasing rate. Makes sense, law of diminishing returns, right? The amount of people, it's going to reach a point. There might be a lot of gains early on when more workers are in, but each additional worker would eventually lead to diminishing returns from having more and more people bigger workforce. The cost could be assumed to be constant, but likely to be increasing. We talked about the cost of living within a city, the land prices being bid up, right? So the cost 
of living in the city tends to go up, potentially at an increasing uh, rate with the size of the workforce, that uh, kind of magnification effect of things building. All right, so we work all solo. Doesn't matter how many workers are in the city. We're just the lone soldier, not minding our own business, um, doing our own thing. And so we can also assume that there's incentive for you not to work solo so that the uh, dollars, the payoff to working um, <coughs> uh, solo are less. And then finally our optimal size of workers. So somebody describe what's going on as the workers grow to N star. What's the economics going on here according to these pieces we put together? The, I mean, that graph up top is really showing, I mean, or the graph at the bottom is showing the difference. Yes. The payoffs and so. Cool. Okay, so this vertical distance here if we stack them up, is this vertical distance here, right? So we got that vertical distance. And it's really showing that there's, and then there's no um, profit being made because the payoff from the innovation equals the cost of living on the top graph, which is down at the, like where they intersect in, at the top. Okay, they intersect up there at the top and we end up here at the bottom. Yeah, and like up top it shows that there's no like true profit being made because the cost of living equals so no profit for anybody. The city grew, but now there's no profit for anybody. It almost, it looks like, I mean, if you compare it in the book at least, and I don't know if that's just because it's in scale or if that's actually, the payoff from innovation is referenced to the baseline, and once you bring the self-sufficient wage in, that's where you get N-star. So N-star isn't necessarily where the cost of living and the payoff from innovation intersect, but it's where, I mean, is that more correct? It's not the nice, clean economic intuition that I'd like you guys to have on this graph. Well, um, in the bottom, like the payoffs are, at the beginning, the payoffs like at the margin are like, are increasing or decreasing. Right? Okay, at the margin, so keep focusing on the margin, okay? Are increasing at a decreasing rate, yeah. that you're describing this. Well, and at first down there, too, the, um, the payoff is decreasing, or increasing and decreasing as well. Okay. Um, but then, I like this reminds me of the one curves from my girl where it was like... Revenue? It is similar to re revenue and cost from micro. The bottom is the marginal payoff curve of innovation, and then uh, you're supposed to maximize it wherever your innovation is self-sufficient. So we want to be here? No, the, you want to be where your uh, return is the same as your self-sufficient wage from the last unit of innovation, so that gets you up to end star. Which is not what the, uh, or the return on innovation costs of city living. That's what I want you to think about, because this is kind of confusing here. This looks good to be, to be here. Why would you start going towards here? Because there's still payoff to that. By who? The By next this. person. By the yeah. next person, right. Not necessarily you. Yeah. You might like to be the, if this is a hundredth, the hundredth person here, you might like to be the 50th person, right? Because you hit the jackpot with the cost you had versus the payoff. But as we start to go further, there's still incentive for somebody to join the city. So the city is still attracting people at the margin because the payoff at the margin for an extra person is greater than the self-sufficient wage. So they come to the city, they come to the city, they come to the city, they come to the city. Now, if this is a dynamic environment, um, the uh, once we get to this, um, cost being just as much as the uh, pay
payoff, the city kind of stops growing in this economic model. Of course, there's lots of other factors going on in, in, the, in reality, but holding all those other things constant, the city's gonna grow up to N star number of people, and then it would stop because there's no incentive for another person to join. <clears throat> okay, so that's just showing an optimal, an optimal <clears throat> amount of the city size given these circumstances and the underlying forces that would cause cities to form these innovative innovation cities, assuming we you know, buy into all of this because we're, we're leaving out all the stuff we talked about before. We're really just stripping things down to saying, hey, what if there's benefits to collaboration? Well, as with most things, the benefits increase, but at a decreasing rate. So the marginal benefit is falling. If we were to do the marginal benefit curve here, it'd be falling. And the cost of those activities is going up. It's increasing at an increasing rate. So the marginal cost curve is up. And that's going to lead to, and this is, uh, as John was saying, the combination of both, because we've got kind of the net difference going on. And then our alternative is to self-sufficiency. So it's slightly different with thinking about the number of workers or the population. So I have a question. Um, on the top one and like compared to the bottom one, is the, is the height of the one on the bottom the difference in between the top two? Right? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> what is, what is self-sufficiency? So this flat line, what is that? Y yeah. A little bit. It's more than your cost. It's actually more, potentially, it, because it is a net payoff, yeah. right? It's the net payoff. So that's what And it's just flat because you're doing your own thing. So you've got a, a payoff here of this amount. Here, you've got a payoff of this amount living in the city. So that would end up being the full distance. Because at A, that's where it begins is, right? Yes, yeah, the A is, the A is this net difference, right? Yeah. yeah. Got that. Yep. Okay, anything else? Problem 12 to get back to the big picture here. What function is being represented by the question in number 12? The pi n equals what it was at 1, 2 plus n, the square root of n minus n over 10. Which one? The bottom one, right? So that's this graph. It's a nonlinear function. So what's your question on it? Well, so How do you do it? Or? Well, if A and B are able to figure it out on C, I think it's more, I think on C it's more just like from a mathematics of it. Cause like, yeah, I it's interesting know. mathematics. I really equal to um, four. To four. Yeah. That's right. So is it end up basically being a quadratic equation? Yep. Yeah, yeah that's, what's, that's what's tricky about it. Did anybody get oh. the So this is what we're doing is we're setting this function equal to four because that's where we're gonna find this point and solve for n. So that's what we're doing graphically. With the function, we end up having a nonlinear function. You can't solve for n if you tried. Um, and so you have to do trial and error or get a computer that'll do trial and error for you, which is all the computer's doing in an iterative process like that, or quadratic formula, opposite b plus or minus, and I'm not gonna ask you to do quadratic formula, but that, that's where that was kind of underlying that. Okay, other question? Anything else? Um, number six. <laughs> number six. So, matter transmitter in a factory. Um, what was your What's your question first, and then I'll decide if uh, we need to if we should read the whole Oh, that's right. This was the thing like instantly goes, right? Yeah. And so it comes, okay. 
So uh, let's go ahead and, and read it. Um, We've got a single factory developed as a result of scale economies. Consider the effects of the new matter transmitters. So we're talking Star Trek here, by the way, if you didn't pick up on that, uh, which can instantly transport goods, but not people, from the factory to any consumer up to 12 miles away with zero marginal cost. The hourly cost of the transmitter is one loaf of bread. Um, Using figure 2.1, which is our martini glass, show the effects of the transmitter on the market area. Is the martini glass still an apt descriptor of the figure, or what is, or if it's not, what is it? So they got this <coughs> goblet thing. So the key is, what's the sides of the martini glass? What are the sides of the martini glass? And, and what is it describing? The marginal cost. And now we've got marginal cost <laughs> of zero. So we end up getting a goblet. So the slope, the distance from the stem is what developed the, the market area, and now that's gone. Yeah, so there's gotta be an account for the cost of operating the thing. So as it <coughs> increases the stem, they, uh, if it increases it too much, then it's not even Are the cool. sides of the goblet equal to the one loaf of bread? Yeah, you still had the one loaf. So. Can you yeah. That? So it was the cost of the transmitter. What? Oops, I guess I got my picture. My eraser. Well, maybe I'll take a picture. So, martini glass, right, gave us our, uh, what was the height of the stem? Four twelfths. Four twelfths from our example. So that was the cost associated with it being at the center. But the net price to the consumer was more the further they lived from the, from the place where they're buying, right? And so that gave us the market area of, what was it? Uh, eight miles on each side. Yeah, eight miles on each side, I think, from that example. Okay, so now we have a transmitter that um, still costs something, right? And what does it cost? One loaf of bread. So I think, yeah, they just kind of gave it as a one. So let me put one here. What if you live a mile away? What does it cost you? One. 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 What if you live two miles? One. 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 And what about this way? Same thing. Okay, so from the center of the factory, we get this flat floor. Mm -hmm. So you would never... And then it goes up on stations and into the market area and vice versa. And what caused that to happen? Is that the part that you're questioning? Well, I mean, if you're going to have everything be one from the spot of the factory, then you're not going to have anybody ever use it because it's actually cheaper than... No, because I don't think that plot line's one. I think that plot line's four twelve. That's still the four twelve, And then it goes, and then up, it goes up, up to six. Up to one. Months. You're right. Yep, yep, you're absolutely right. So would it be six? So it's actually, this is the four twelves. That was the cost, and then the cost of the transmitting was one. Yeah, it's one per hour, but that has to be, wouldn't that be factored into the total cost somehow? Because that's basically the same thing as labor, so. But it's flat. Yeah, it's flat. So we're still just adding it. Yeah, we're just. So it'd be 16, 12, so Oh, be I got 16, it. It'd be over yeah. one. It's over one, so. But at, if you're still at the factory, there's no cost. Right? No. Well, so it has one, to be a labor cost. At one mile out, we start to do this. We add in the cost of the flat, and there's your goblet right here. That's true. If you're yeah. at the factory, it's still. Then why wouldn't you just. Four twelves. If you're outside and it has to be transferred, then you have the flat cost. Then no one would ever do that. Uh, yeah, I guess that, that might be possible. Because I mean, the, like, the one actually put it outside. You're saying the one actually put it outside what they what the home production was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, if that's maybe they screwed that up. Yeah, because nobody would use it potentially if it's yes. higher. Uh, but it still is tracking out the cost. It still looks like this. So if the if the question's asking for what does the what does it look like? It looks like that. The fact that home production's down here and that you'd never do it is a different question. But that would be the look of it. 
not too big a deal. But that, that the main thing to be thinking about was we're if we change the dynamic or the technology, then it could impact Wouldn't the you results. A mile wide though, or even if you were a quarter of a mile away, then it would still be one. Then it would still be one with any sort of transmission the way they described it. Um, I think you could do a combination, couldn't you? I mean, it seemed like you could be, uh, if you're, if it did cost you one, it'd be better to travel there. Again, I'm getting deeper into the problem than we're there, but you could travel there cheaper than the cost of the transmission. So you would have the martini glass with sides. Right, the martini glass would have sides. And if it's cost-free to go anywhere around the world, then well, it's not everybody around the world would do it. Right? There is no market area. That's the part that I'm struggling with well, a little this bit. This one says it can only there's, take it up to 12 miles away. Oh, that, that's right. That was the limit. So that's why yeah, it's 24 miles. That's why it's 24 miles. Yeah. So if, if it could go any distance, then there is no there is no bounds. Okay, so what you're saying, the top green line, is that one or is that 16 twelves? Uh, 16 twelves, right. So we were adding one apparently, but then the transmitter only went to a max. And so then I'm thinking we kind of look like this if we allow my little nuance in here. I think the book was intending to have it look like that. Why would there be? Because it was 24, uh, 12 miles was the max is what they said for this Star Trek mm -hmm. transmitter. Well, why would they go up on the end? What does that do? Uh, nobody can, the cost is infinitely high. It, it's just a boundary. It ends. You could probably just terminate it there, too. It can't, yeah, it can't go any further. All right, this just kind of pushes your brain, pushes your brain a little bit to think about manipulating the, the graphs. All right, any other ones? But the cost of them making it at home still be one. So wouldn't that where the top line would be? Yeah. Uh, that's their alternative. Which might, what John was saying is that if that, that would cause them not to do it. If, if the cost of doing it at home was below. lower than 16 twelfths, then nobody's going to do it. So the, you're not gonna and, but that's where I was saying we do have a market still potentially in here. And, and if we allowed there to be traveling yeah. to it still yeah. at a cheaper rate, then you've got this kind of mixed martini and then it flattens out. Well, I mean, you still have your market area, the original one as well. Because yeah, what was, the, what was the original market area? Eight on each side. So that's, that's probably your, it was eight Yeah. So on each side. So there's your, so the picture actually looks like this probably. So but now it's 12. Eight, and then it goes out to 24. Uh, truthfully, eight plus, then the, the magic transmitter can go at most out to 12. So okay, we got four more miles. Sense. There's, I think, the goblet they were talking about. I yeah. don't think that's right, though, because, because it's still cheaper for them to walk the extra four <laughs> miles and get it there than it is to actually have it transmitted if the, if the marginal cost is a low. Oh yeah, yeah. If it's if it's a full loaf, yeah. That, that's what that's what doesn't make sense with the problem. Yeah. yeah. So you're not supposed to put this in the chat, right? I think that they should have just made it like a quarter of a loaf or something. That way you would just increase your stem and things would have gone. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We can increase and decrease the stem. So yeah, don't worry about that problem. Well, I mean, it it served its purpose. Forced us to think about the stems, the slopes the boundaries, innovation and technology. So actually, in that respect, it was a good problem with not so good answers. <laughs> if that's we came up with better answers than what, the, than, than what they did. So that's the good. Just, the book's just basically wants to get you that's something that kind of was like uprights. So draw yeah. Russ, would you mind walking us through four? I just need like a little bit more practice. A little nudge. Spring-loaded sneakers. Consider the example in 2.1 martini glass showing the net price to the factory product. Suppose all consumers switch to spring-loaded sneakers. 
uh, decreasing the walking time per round uh, mile trip from 1 12th to 1 18th. All right, so who wants to help out on that? <clears throat> so would you part A or part B or what, what's the... Okay, so the slope of the net price curve does what? So our, we're back to martini glasses here. What happens to the... It started out at 112 and then decreased, so it flattened to 118, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So... On the martini glass, we're at again four twelves. And right now it costs one twelfth to go one mile, right? Mm -hmm. So if we go up here, this is five twelfths. The person who lives a mile out uh, runs five twelfths net price. Now we got super sneakers. Is the cost going to go down or up is the first thing to think about. The net price is going to go down. So that helps you think it's about the slope, too. Years. If you just kind of go with the gut reaction. First of all, you've got to be able to kind of prove this to yourself. Um, so instead of going up a 12th, we're going to go up an 18th living a mile out, which then lowers that slope. And Katie, okay, what I did was change the 4 twelfths into 6 eighteenths. You can. Yeah. yeah. You can convert that if you want to add them up, but it's going to lower this. So now the new martini glass is going to look like that. Okay. It's going to flatten on both sides and give you a larger market area. All right. So the number of factories goes from three to two. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Three to two. So that's getting back to the how many they're going to be when they're stacked up. The how the width? Yeah. Who wants to take that? How do we get this width here? So if you're at six eighteenths and it's one eight. So before you even go that part, what is our alternative? When do we quit? We make it ourselves, and what does that cost? 12 twelfths, one. So that's, you gotta remember that end point is, hey, I can do this myself at 12 twelfths. So if 12 twelfths is up here, that's where switch. I quit. Yeah. So switch it to 18, 18. just see if that's Oh, and then works. switch this to eight, oh, to get, to get your yeah. part, yeah, yeah. It okay. Easier. So 18 eighteenths to solve for this particular problem. Yeah, yeah. Right. So Which is the same height, 12 right. twelfths and 18 eighteenths. But now we're gonna, we're gonna start moving and we're gonna have to buy an 18th and we're solving for that market area. So instead of four twelfths, we have six eighteenths because that's the same ratio of one and three uh, plus twelve eighteenths. Yeah. So you'd have eighteen eighteenths is where you're trying to go to. So you have eighteen eighteenths minus the original investment of six eighteenths is twelve eighteenths. And for each model is one eighteenth. It becomes one. Or the top number becomes your answer. Per side, yeah. Per side, yeah. Per side, yeah. So your market area is 12, or 24 miles. Okay. So you got a lot of geom. Don't forget that you got a lot of geometry going on with this, right? So that market area is the radius. You can start kind of doing some triangles. You could even bring a good old Pythagoras in there, a squared plus b squared equals c squared if you needed to at some point. But... But otherwise, think about uh, traveling along here, the cost, and then this is the transportation cost, bringing you up to the one point. All right, well, let's move on. <coughs> let's move on. Yes, why don't you turn those in? Hey, Marv, uh, the three that we did together with them. What's that? The three that we did together with them. No. The ones that we did in class, you do not need to turn in. Sweet, which is good. 
Okay, why don't you turn it in? I'm just curious. Um, I basically just want you guys to turn them in because I don't want you working on them in class. And we can talk after if you've got individual questions further. And again, as long as you put some work into it, use the answer key, you didn't get it, that's what we're, we're going to do is kind of. We move out chapter three now. Chapter three. No, we're not. I take that back. Sorry, we're wrapping up number two. Um, I thought we just did. Nope. There's a little bit more called a little thing called the appendix. Oh, we are going over that. Okay. This is where I'm at. So these are the these are the same concepts with a little more meat on the bones for uh, the appendix. So we're going to look a little closer. Remember the weight gaining, weight losing, and, and kind of think about those activities. That's what the, the appendix just goes into that um, a little bit deeper. So where will a transfer-oriented firm locate? So transport cost is dominant. Two elements of that, procurement cost and distribution costs. So imagine that we are a producer. We use inputs to make output, the normal production function process, right? But transport costs are an important issue for us. So we have to pay that. That's part of our expenses now in our expenditure function. Transport cost is dominant. And so we've got two aspects of that, distribution cost and procurement cost. So procurement cost is getting the uh, inputs. Distribution cost is getting the stuff to market. <clears throat> All right, so we have uh, assumed other inputs are ubiquitous, is our classic thing that we've been doing. What does ubiquitous mean? Something is ubiquitous. They're available everywhere. I've noticed President Eichner uh, kind of uses that word in different ways. So, so we've got all locations. It's just kind of magic that it's available all the time. It's just easy to get to. It's just an assumption of the model that somehow unexplained it gets there all uh, nice and fast and easy and cost free. Okay, so we got some fixed prices, variable prices. So here's our goal is to minimize transport costs. So here's our objective function. We got procurement costs, we got distribution costs. We're going to choose a location such that we minimize those transport costs. Do you use the name on Blackboard yet? Or? No. But if you send me a little email, that might give me a good, good reminder. <laughs> All right. So it's getting thick. We've got some formulas. Weight, transportation cost per pound per mile. How many miles are we going? So that's our formula. The stars are multiplication. Yeah, the stars are multiplication. So for our input price, something weighs three pounds. Our input into making Mountain Dew costs three pounds. It's $4 per pound per mile is what FedEx tells us it's going to be. And we got 10 miles to go from the input source to our factory. What's that going to run? Good. So 3 times 4 is 12, times 10, 120 bucks. All right, same thing for our distribution cost. Our function is distance from the market to the factory. X is the distance uh, to the factory. Actually, that's a little bit of a typo, because I got the, this is the distance to the factory. Uh, this is not quite right here. Is it? I need, oh yeah, no, that, that'll work, that'll work. Okay, um, I'll think about that later, see if that cleans up, I think that's okay. Um, 
let's see what this looks like graphically. <coughs> we talked about this in the, in the main guts of the chapter, the differences in cost. So suppose we've got these numbers. Weight gaining or weight losing? Weight losing. 10 pounds with their wood, the bats lose weight as they go. Why the difference in the transport rate? That one's kind of confusing. But Katie? Not a matter, this is per mile. Cost per pound per mile or per ton per mile. Because it might be more fragile. Or okay, it could be more fragile, right? So maybe the truck that needs to haul it, it needs to be refrigerated. Maybe the, um, the weight of the springs needs to be less than one or the other, right? Or handle with care if it's more fragile. So it's at least possible. What's that? Could it be like express or something? No, I'm not going to allow it to that uh, time to dip. Well, Maybe yeah, no, I think you're right, Colby. I think that would be fair. Could be we could bring in time. If you need to get it to market faster, maybe the, the rate of travels faster or something. Like That's possible. And it could be a different type of transportation. I mean, we talked about the truck, but one could be by plane, one could be by truck. So anyway, just wanted to point out that that, that variable could exist, that it's not immediately obvious that, well, if it costs this what, per pound, what's the difference? So there, there could be other things in there. All right, so where's the optimal place to locate? Do we locate near the resource? Do we locate near the output or somewhere in between? In between what? Near the resource? Okay. Input in between but near the resource. Anybody else? Why do you say? So this, this number here is the cost that it ends up being. Physical weight times the rate. So 10 times 1, 3 times 2 is 6. So this, the output cost $6. The inputs are 10. Yeah, so where are we going to locate? Okay, so you think there's going to be somewhere in between that we have to solve for? Yeah. Okay. All right, well, let's look at it uh, graphically here. Transport cost is the cost of both, right? So there's where the two are equal. Do we want to locate here? No. 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 We want to minimize costs. Yep. So we would be, the whole time our best spot would be right on the money. There's not a, in this particular problem, there's not a, there's not an in-betweener. Okay, everybody see this graph, all right? So look, distribution costs, look at what's going on with the scale. We'll do this once in a while on different models. So one thing to notice here is the distance. So if we're near here, we're moving further away, distribution cost falls when we're at the final uh, destination spot. So we're 10 miles from the forest, or if we're right on top of the forest, then we're going to have different input costs. But our total cost function is the sum of the two, and so if we're going to minimize costs, we're going to locate here. All right. There's a couple examples. You mean milk and cheese or mild? What's that? You put mild and cheese. Mm. What about output? I'm just kind of speeding through this because it's just it's just the opposite, right? So if we have a cheaper cost with if it's a weight gaining or losing, losing. weight losing, then it's better to locate at the distribution point. The total cost. We just did a weight gaining. Weight gaining. Yeah, sorry. 
weight gaining firm. So <laughs> as we, our total cost function, total transport costs are going down. Again, what's implicit here is that transport costs are a large fraction of our costs. So don't forget that with this. That's why we're focusing in on it. The real production process has lots of different costs associated with it. But if transportation cost is important, then the total cost function is going to fall. If your location is closer to the endpoint, you're going to be minimizing cost by being closer to, the, to that direction. OK, we'll see you on Thursday. Are you going to be in your office? Um, maybe. I think right at, like right now? Yeah, yeah, I can meet you if you want.